Welcome to the Softland Central podcast, your home for market entry knowledge and resources. Softland Central is brought to you by Softland Partners, an online marketplace to help you find best fit resources for your market entry. Find them at softlandpartners.com. How do how do entrepreneurs navigate the process? I'm in, you know, uh, pick a country. You mentioned Brazil. Obviously, that's a little more complicated because they're not a treaty country. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if we could talk about sort of a non-treaty company or country yeah. and then and navigating the process uh, from, say, Brazil and then maybe a treaty company like the U country like the UK. You know, what's mm -hmm. the how do we navigate that? So maybe taking the, the non-treaty country first. How does how sure. does an entrepreneur navigate that? Right. So, hey, I am a, well, I guess there's a few different things. So I have a Brazilian passport. I'm a Brazilian citizen, lived in Brazil my whole life or not, whatever, but that's my passport. Uh, so there's two different ways you could go about it. Number one is I own a company in Brazil that I, that has multiple employees. I plan on keeping that country in Brazil and I'm going to start a new company in the United States. Great. You might be a perfect fit for an L1. Option two, I do not have a company in Brazil, but I've saved my whole life. I've got this investment. Next step, do you have Italian relatives? Maybe you can get an Italian passport. Or are you able to get a Turkey or a Grenada passport? Or another one, maybe. I mean, who knows? You might have relatives in Canada, or I have no idea. You know, I would, it, but if, you know, if, if you don't have the dual citizenship already, you've probably already explored that in Brazil. It's one of those countries that just almost everybody has dual citizenship that can, mm. right? So uh, maybe that's where you say, okay, I'm going to get the Grenada citizenship. I'm going to get the Turkey citizenship. Then I'm going to go for the E2. Mm. Um, if, you know, if you are playing more of a long game, maybe you say, all right, maybe what I'll do is I'll start a company in Brazil. And in three years from now, I'll apply for the L. Right. Uh, I know that I'm going to need to get some employees. I'm going to need to get some revenues. I'm going to need this elder, this business to be able to run by itself a lot of the time. Right. Because I'm going to be in the United States a majority of the time. Then you can start that. Um, you could also say if neither one of those you feel like is going to work for you, then you say, hey, all right. I've got a couple of buddies that live in uh, uh, Colorado. And maybe we could all start a company together. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, I know, you know, we have some ability in X, Y, and Z area. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do for the next 24 months is I'm going to get, I'm going to be in every blog, trade publication, whatever. I'm going to get my salary up here in uh, Brazil. I'm going to try to meet those extraordinary ability requirements of the O1. Um, so, but I would say probably an L1 or an E2 through that second passport are probably going to be better bet. Mm -hmm. But again, that, that kind of just gives you a, an example, right? Like, well, do you have friends that you could open a business with? Do you already own a business? Could you get a second passport? All of those things are questions, right? And yeah. we'll kind of put you into whatever category. Also, hey, I'm a Brazilian citizen. I don't have anything else going on. Um, I don't even have a company, but I inherited about 2 million bucks. Ah, EB-5, right? right? So there's another option um, for somebody from the UK or Canada or Argentina or, you know, myriad of other countries, you would say, uh, hey, I'm ready to start a business in the United States. What do I want to start? That's always the first question. What business do you want to start or buy? People come to me, what do I buy or start? Like, I have no idea. And I wouldn't even recommend to you because you would probably hate whatever I recommended anyway. So whatever country company you want to buy or start, in whatever state you want to buy or start it in, doesn't matter to me. Uh, and then kind of go through that E2 process, which is make the investment. And that's something that I work with clients on too. Like some, some businesses are very simple. Oh, I'm buying a hotel. It's a $200,000 hotel. Okay, buy it. That's easy, right? Investments made, we're ready to go. Some people come to me and they say, well, I really want to start a marketing company and I need about $30,000 to start it. And I'm like, that might be true. But you also have a second layer of an immigration requirement, which is a substantial investment. And $30,000, particularly if you have to go through the embassy in London, is not going to pass that test. Mm. So then the second question becomes, well, how am I going to spend $100,000 on a company that like essentially runs out of a WeWork, right? Buy two. 
Yes, yeah, exactly. I start like 20 of them. So that's one of the things I work with clients on too. And I always tell them do the 18 month test, sit down, write a list of everything you're going to need for the next 18 months and buy it all now, right? Oh, I need, I need one computer for me. And then I am going to have an assistant who doesn't need a computer. And then in, in two years, I'm going to have four employees. I'm like, great, buy four computers. Hmm. Oh, you thought you were going to buy the Dell? Buy the iMac Pro. <laughs> Great. Like, you know, these are the things, oh, you you know, you want to start a marketing a campaign and it's going to occur over the last next 12 months, pay for 12 months up front. Just get it done now. All of that stuff. Two birds with one stone. One, you meet your investment threshold. And two, now it's just all profit. You've already paid for your lease for a year. You've already paid for your marketing for a year. You've already bought all the computers. Like now you just sit back and make money to pay yourself back for that. Right. So, um, that would be the the step for the the uk or the treaty country citizen hmm. is figuring out the business how you're going to make that investment making the investment and then applying for the visa that makes sense yeah. so um you know i would imagine and i think you alluded to the fact that it, sometimes people uh sort of uh, uh go through this process or, or endeavor to go through this process themselves sort of self uh diy i guess do it yourself mm -hmm. uh, yeah. process so uh, working with a professional such as yourself, mm. what, what, um, uh, what advantages are there in that process or maybe what hazards have you seen happen when people try to do it, do it themselves? That, that may be an easier way yes. to identify. Yeah. yeah, so the E2 in particular, the thing that makes it great is also the thing that makes it almost impossible as an individual, um, which is there aren't very many requirements. And there is no guideline about how to show any of those requirements, right? So you said, oh, what's the investment? There's no minimum. Yeah. How many employees do I need? No minimum. How do I show investments? I don't know. How do I find the source of investment? Just show it. So those are the requirements. Show it. Do it. You know, and I'm like, wait, what is that? So in the E2 in particular, experience with filing these is all that you have. And if you've never filed one before, it could be very difficult um, because there are not um, specific ways that you prove different requirements, right? So, uh, and everybody's case is different. Mm -hmm. No, that makes So that makes you inherit, will do it, whatever. I just, I, on the other hand, I've been working for the last 15 years and I've got two duplexes that I make some money on. And then I sold this other business that was like three years ago. And then my mom gave me 25. I mean, like, how are you going to show all of that? What's more, some countries have page limits. So then you got to figure out, okay, what's actually an important document and what's not because I can't include it all. How, what, what do I need to include in this business plan? Where do I even start? Then back to soft landing, right? Which is oh, I don't even know how to do this. I wish I had someone who could introduce me to somebody that can help me do X or Y. Or, hey, I really want to find a business, but I don't even know where to start. Or uh, I bought this business, but it's losing money. Can I still apply for an E2? What documents do I need to show that I can turn it around, right? It's, lo it's a loser now, but I can turn it around and win. And So it's just a wild, wild world. And um, in fact, that is the reason that I focus so much on it because there are so many weird nuances with the E2 that you need to do it most of the time in order to understand all of the potential fact pattern, you know, missteps or weird things and different consulates do things in different ways and some email and some mail and then how do you make the appointment and you know, just the logistics of it alone. Um, some people have a very simple case, but most people don't. And, and I'll be honest, like I still get calls to this day of people that are like, well, here's the deal. And then here's what happened. And this other thing happened. And I'm like, huh, we'll make it work, but I'm not exactly clear on how we're going to do it right now, but we're going to figure it out. So there are so many potential pitfalls specifically with the E2, because there is just very little guidance. Yeah. And and when you're working with the Department of State, which you normally are for an E2, it all comes down to who does your interview. That's the reality. So you have to put these documents together and prove the requirements in such a way, this is what I tell all my clients, 
We're going to put this application together in such a way that only a crazy person would deny it. Every once in a while, you get a crazy person reviewing your documents, just so you know, it happened. But we're going to make it so clear because any questions just reduce the odds of approval. So you've got to just, you need to know how to lay out that application, show them what they need, bullet point it out, only the exact documents they're looking for, nothing more, nothing less. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot. I don't even remember your question, but there was an answer for you <laughs> or something. I don't remember. So yeah, well, and, and no, you answered it perfectly. And, and it, it, but I, I think if I were going to summarize is, is really your role in the process is to act as a translator. It's sort of to take oh. all of, all of their stuff and, and, and also to objectively look at where they are besides sort of organizing it in, in the application process and guiding them with the interview. It, it, it sounds like your work even potentially in some cases starts before that in terms of uh, oh. guiding them or, or connecting them to investment uh, possibilities that, uh, that help them with the requirements as well. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'll give you a, a 30 second overview of how I work specifically because yeah, sometimes people go, oh, okay, well, when I get all these documents together, I'll call you. I'm like, no, 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 no. Because you don't want, we don't want to have to go back and switch a bunch of stuff that you already did and now it's running in this weird way. So I tell people, once you have decided on the business that you're either going to buy or start and you know that you have the money, you can, you have access to the money, that is when you call the attorney. So I look over the purchase agreement, for example, for immigration purposes. I don't know anything about the value of the business or, you know, what you're buying or what you're not, but making sure that some of that language that I need to see from an immigration side is there. Um, and then every two weeks during the entire process, it takes most people three to four months to get all the documents together that we need for the E2. Every two weeks throughout that process, and some people have been with me for more than a year, mm. for sure. Uh, so we talk that whole time. They ask questions. Okay, well, we talked to this person, but they said they can only give us a receipt if it looks like this. Is that okay? Or... I, I, you know, we tried to open the bank account. It won't let me do it. Can I pay for my personal account in the foreign country? And like, how am I going to get all of those questions we work through together? Um, so that's why when we talked about that service industry thing too, like, how am I going to spend all of this money? We talk about that and think through some different options. We talk about all of those things. So yeah, it's really important to have an immigration attorney with you the whole process. Yeah. Then once that three to four months of document gathering is up or however long it takes you to get the documents, then I put all of those documents together and then submit to the consulate. Then we do the interview training once we know when your interview is. So it is definitely, it is not um, where I just put a bunch of, I put a PDF and an email and send it off. It, if only, oh my gosh, life would be much simpler on my end, but it is a, it is an entire process that usually lasts about six months with them with a client. That's the average from the day they sign up till the day they get the visa. It's about six months ish, um, or long. Some believe me, I've had many, many longer and I've had some shorter too, but, um, yeah, and it is a hand holding. It's really a white glove service. We walk you through every single step all along the way. Very cool. Very cool. So how would you suggest somebody go about selecting an attorney for, uh, to work through this process? Yeah, I mean, for sure, somebody who has experience doing it. I mm -hmm. think that's kind of right off the top. But then I would also say somebody that uh, you feel really comfortable with. And I tell people that all the time for attorneys. Um, sometimes you work really well with people and they are very interested in what you're doing and vice versa. And then sometimes, you know, you get someone, you end up talking to the um, paralegal most of the time, they're very confused, they don't really know what you're doing, you know, whatever. And, and sometimes it's location, right? Like I do things all over the world. My clients are not even all over the US, they're all over the world. Um, and a lot of people like that very simple process. We do Zoom calls, we do just do WhatsApp calls, everything goes into online files and you know, a lot of people like that. Some people are really like, I'm starting a business in Houston, Texas. I need you to be in Houston, Texas. You don't, but some people want that, right? So great. You need to find an attorney who's located in Houston, Texas or what have you. Um, you know, and some people are uh, really want a specific type of experience. Mm. Um, you know, oh, I need somebody who's done surface-based businesses with the EG. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. You should talk to somebody who's done a lot of surface-based businesses with E2s. 
Those are the types of things that I say to look for. Experience is the most because in E2s, L1s as well, but E2s in particular, like experience is the only guidance that any of us have. There, there's nothing, there are no rules, there's no regulations, there's no statutes that give you any kind of real guidance in how to do it. So you said experience and then, um, and then also the, the, the amount of rapport you have with the yeah. person. Yes. Um, are there particular questions that, um, you know, you wish you were asked, but you sort of rarely are asked by, by clients mm -hmm. that you just go, you know, because I know in our business, uh, I get questions periodically that, you know, that I, we love because it shows the clients really paying attention um, and they're really considered about the process. But is there a, a question that, that you wish you got more often? That is good. Uh, I do this for a living. <laughs> I was going to say, geez, Bill, you got this interview thing down. Next time you're going to be bawling about something. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your mom. No, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, that's a really good question. I think the clients that work well with me are uh, maybe a little bit more prepared. Sometimes I get people who are like, okay, great, let's do it. But they haven't, I, I know they haven't really thought through, like, what does that mean? So I would say the best clients are ones that have maybe done a little online research as well. So mm -hmm. they at least have some sense of what is this? What are the basic requirements, right? Oh, I knew I'm going to need to pick a business. I'm going to need to invest in that business. Like just having that information is great. Um, and I would say, yeah, so, so people maybe who have done a little, a little bit of homework on it um, are the best. Has to, I'm trying to think of a really good question. I can't think of any right off the bat that are like, I wish people asked me this. Mm, okay. um, because, yeah, there's just everybody's so fact dependent, right? So every case is kind of different. Mm. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Um, well, this has been, been great, Angie. Is there mm. anything else about the visa process, and particularly for entrepreneurs uh, looking to enter the US? Anything else that you would want to share that uh, in some way might, might help uh, folks coming in? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, enthusiasm is great. And I, as you can probably see, I have quite a bit of it. I love entrepreneurs. <laughs> I love these. I love helping them get to the U.S. Uh, because I also think the U.S. is great. And having super smart, motivated people in the U.S., like, how could we go wrong? Like, it's, it's awesome all the way around. I love it. Um, so having a lot of enthusiasm is going to help. Um, you know, I think that, that most people who move through with this probably own their own business or used to own their own business. So they know it's, it's not uh, a breeze. You're, there's going to be, you know, we got to get some documents together. Then you're going to be here running a business, right? So uh, there's work involved. But anybody who just uh, has a real enthusiasm um, for their business and has an enthusiasm for getting to the United States is going to make a great candidate. Um, and is, and um, so, yeah, I just, that, I think that's, that's something that's going to make people really um, going to, they're going to do great. They're going to do great. Uh, if they have enthusiasm, they know their business, they know what they want to do. They're sure about their decisions and that they're going to do great. Perfect. Well, this has been phenomenal. Thank you so much, Angie, for taking Thank the time. You. I think the information you've shared is really going to help a lot of entrepreneurs. So, um, yeah, kudos to you, standing ovation, uh, a round of applause, all those types of things. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. This has been, been a lot of fun. So uh, Thanks, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.